Welcome to El Paso's Transportation Museum. You may think that the history of transportation in El Paso begins with trains or wagons or maybe even horses. But for people of El Paso and everywhere else on the planet, transportation starts with two feet. Humans have always walked to get somewhere. Eventually, we figured out how to ride animals. And then we created machines to transport us. And all of this progress in transportation can be found in El Paso's transportation history. Native peoples travel the North American continent by foot, covering many miles a day. They knew where to find water and shelter as they crossed the high deserts in the region that is now El Paso County. More than 5,000 years ago, during the Archaic period, native people settled in what became El Paso's west side, at the present-day Keystone site on Donovan Drive. Whoever these people were, they got around by walking. It's likely they settled in the El Paso area after walking up or down the Rio Grande. Their settlement of pit houses is the largest to be found west of the Mississippi. And they built this first-of-a-kind village within walking distance of the river and their food supply. In the 1500s, the Spaniards introduced the horse into what is now the southwestern United States. In 1598, Don Juan de Oñate led a caravan of Spanish soldiers, colonial settlers, and converted Indians, along with thousands of head of cattle, from Santa Barbara, Mexico, through El Paso, and up the Rio Grande to what is now the Santa Fe area. Oñate is remembered for naming El Paso, which he meant as a place to cross the Great River. Many in his caravan walked the 1,500 miles along the Camino Real, or Royal Highway, but many also rode horses. When they reached the Pueblo Indian settlements in what is today northern New Mexico, it was the first time the Native Americans saw horses. Before long, many Native American tribes became expert riders. On horseback, they could travel longer distances, expanding their territory for trading and hunting. In 1849, the California Gold Rush brought untold numbers of travelers through El Paso. East to west traffic increased, and cross-country trails were established to meet the demand for transportation across the continent. Wagon trains and stagecoaches approached El Paso from every direction, braving dangerous journeys across Indian territory. The Butterfield Trail went straight through El Paso, and Waco tanks in eastern El Paso County became an important stop for stagecoaches. The desert rock formation collects rainwater, a valuable commodity for travelers on long, hot journeys through the desert. From the air, you can still see old trails around Waco tanks, heading off in many directions. The famous Butterfield Trail helped shape the American Southwest and improved transportation to and from El Paso. For years, the town of Franklin, as El Paso was known then, was the important midpoint of the Butterfield Trail. The El Paso station was known as the best. The pass of the north was the gate to the west. The bugle blast in the town in a rage, cause everyone was waiting on the Butterfield stage. This stagecoach stop, built in 1858, helped El Paso grow into a sizable town with new streets and buildings. Twice a week, Butterfield Overland stages left El Paso headed west for San Francisco and east to St. Louis. Wagon trains also came through El Paso on these same trails. In 1881, transportation in and around El Paso changed forever. The first of four rail lines built into El Paso, making El Paso a major connection point for passenger and freight service. By 1900, eight railroads had connected through El Paso, making the booming city one of the most important rail connections in the western United States. Today, railroads are still big business in El Paso, with several dozen freight trains moving through the city each day. From the 1880s to now, the mining companies from northern Mexico, Arizona, and New Mexico 
have used the railroads to get their ore to El Paso for smelting, refining, and processing. This is locomotive number one, and it now lives in the El Paso Railroad and Transportation Museum on San Antonio Street, across from the El Paso Convention Center. This train engine and tender car have been restored to museum condition, which means that it was returned to its 1909 appearance, but it cannot operate as a locomotive. Welcome to the cab of locomotive number one. When the locomotive was in operation, the fire was inside the firebox there, and that would all be flame, because uh, for the locomotive to operate, you had to have fire to boil the water, to make steam, to make the locomotive go. The fact that locomotive number one is still here in El Paso is remarkable. The Smithsonian Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. wanted to acquire locomotive number one, but a group of El Pasoans decided to keep it in El Paso through grants they got to restore old number one and build it a museum. Locomotive number one sat in several different locations around El Paso since it was retired in 1903, and much of the time since then it was outside in the elements. It was at the Centennial Museum at the University of Texas at El Paso since 1960. A few years later, it was encased in a glass building. As the Smithsonian's interest in locomotive number one increased, so did the desire from several El Pasoans to keep it here. In 2002, locomotive number one was given by the University of Texas at El Paso to the city of El Paso, which had acquired federal grants to remove locomotive number one from the Centennial Museum restore it professionally, and place it on display in a new transportation museum downtown. Moving an historic locomotive from a building up on a hill 30 feet above street level can present some challenges. The end of the building was removed for the train's exit path. Next, two large cranes lifted a reinforced flatbed trailer into the air next to the end of the train building. Railroad tracks had been welded to the trailer so they could be connected to the museum's exhibit tracks once the trailer was up in the air. It was a slow process to winch the locomotive out of the museum building and onto the trailer. It took more than an hour, but eventually locomotive number one was secured on the flatbed tracks, which were then disconnected from the museum tracks. The cranes lowered the trailer and train to the ground, where a truck was attached. Locomotive number one then got a police escort through El Paso on Interstate 10 to the rigging company building. Locomotive number one will probably never go this fast again. At the rigging company, an expert in old train restoration inspected the locomotive and tender car. The focus of the project is to conserve as much of the original machine, as much of the original wood, uh, metal, whatever, as we possibly can and replace as little as we can. The restoration portion is the replacement and uh, cleaning up of things, repainting of things. The conservation portion is saving things. Up on the front end, we have really heavy buildup of, uh, of paint. And uh, what I was doing up there was using a needle chipper, which is an air-powered tool, which has a whole series of little chisels. And it chips off paint and rust and uh, whatever's on there. Uh, we started off, of course, with the engine totally assembled. And one of the first things that we had to do was to uh, inspect the locomotive and make notes of what we found in our inspection. We have the engine up on a stand here so we can get underneath the locomotive. We have uh, the, uh, the tender off of the frame so that we can you know, assess the exact condition of the tender frame and all the various parts. The tender is completely disassembled. We've uh, cut out uh, virtually all of the bad wood. All of the wood that we're going to be replacing has been cut out. And right now we're in the process of uh, starting to shape the new pieces of wood uh, for uh, installation. This is the cab of the locomotive. And we know that portions of the cab have been replaced. Originally, the cab was mahogany. And we have a little bit less than half of the cab, as you see it right here, is mahogany. We figure that the finer work, the more detailed work, with the better quality wood like mahogany is, we figure that is original and the other is not. One of the neat things about this locomotive is that we know that it is all original 
from 1909 because 1909 was when the locomotive was fixed up and put on display. And since 1909, basically all that's been done to it, it's been repainted, you know, every few years. So uh, there's lots of paint on there, but very little repairs. Steam locomotives need to have their supply of water replenished continuously. Most steam locomotives pull a tender behind them and the tender has the spare water and the fuel, wood, coal, oil, whatever. It'd be easier to take the whole tender frame apart and build a whole new tender frame, but one of the main focuses of this conservation, this restoration project, is we want to save just as much of the original material as we can. The restoration took more than a year, but it was worth it because the rebuilt and repainted locomotive number one ended up looking as good as new. The next task was to take the locomotive for another ride through El Paso to downtown. The new building on San Antonio Street at Durango was built as an El Paso City bus terminal with the northwest corner created as a permanent home for locomotive number one. It was a major undertaking to deliver the train engine and tender car to the Transportation Museum. Once locomotive number one was in its final parking place, the building was completed around the exhibit. The museum was formally dedicated in February 2004 as an El Paso City Museum by Mayor Joe Wardy. The museum is open to the public. Call 915-422-3420 for information. The era of railroads was also the era of trolleys in El Paso. Part of the region's booming transportation industry, trolleys started as mule-drawn carts traveling on rails. Mules were replaced by electric streetcars and they helped connect El Paso's expanding suburbs and rural communities to the city. In 1902, the electric streetcars ran on the only international trolley line in the world. They crossed the Rio Grande on international bridges carrying passengers to and from El Paso and Juarez, Mexico. For 72 years, the international service was popular with residents of both cities. But eventually, Juarez officials felt they were too popular, taking Mexican shoppers and their money into the United States. In 1974, the city of Juarez ended the world's only international trolley service. Air transportation came to El Paso in the early 1900s as the U.S. Army experimented with surveillance flights in the area. Biplanes were used in the search for Mexican revolutionary Pancho Villa after he raided Columbus, New Mexico in 1916. They didn't find Villa, but the Army did learn valuable lessons about using airplanes in wartime that became part of the U.S. efforts in World War I. Barnstormers came to El Paso as they performed across the United States. The planes were shipped here by rail, then assembled for performances at El Paso's Washington Park. World-famous aviator Charles Lindbergh flew into El Paso in 1927, and commercial airline service began in El Paso in 1929. As aviation grew in importance across the country, so did El Paso's airport. Today, the El Paso International Airport is one of the top-rated facilities in the country. Each year, it handles more than 3 million passengers and 86,000 tons of air freight. That makes it one of the busiest freight facilities on the U.S.-Mexico border. The airport and adjacent business parks continue to expand to meet the growing demand for air travel and cargo through El Paso. History is everywhere in El Paso, even in the roads we travel every day. Many of the city's major streets and highways follow old Indian paths, the marked trails of Spanish explorers, or old cross-country wagon trails. And just as the city changed when the railroads arrived in the early 1880s, so did its streets. <laughs> 
Some were paved to make it easier to move cargo and people about the booming town, and the city established its first public transportation system in 1882. Interstate 10 arrived in El Paso in the 1960s. Today, it's the region's primary interstate, used by local commuters every day. It's also a major east-west route for truckers and travelers on cross-country journeys. The Texas Department of Transportation maintains more than 1,900 miles of state roads in its El Paso district. And every day there are more than 12 million vehicle miles on those roads. Whether walking or riding, you can see that El Paso history includes all types of transportation used by man. Be sure to tell your friends about the history of transportation that we have right here in El Paso. And thanks for visiting the El Paso Transportation Museum.